It's not, this is not his first, second, third, fourth, fifth time in Nigeria, but it's his first time at Wolfbeck. He is, let me start this way, the senior pastor of a Nairobi-based Purpose Center church. But there's a dimension that he also brings, which is what I want to also speak about. Because now he's a he's a proper listen to what I'm saying. He he had a conference some months back, right? With Apostle Vega, Joshua Selman. So he's a proper, all right, in a stadium facility. But with that, he's an, an internationally accomplished business leader and serial fintech entrepreneur. In 2010, he founded the Mode Group, a fintech company spanning over 26 countries in Africa, Asia, and the Middle East. He was a key negotiator in the government of Kenya UNOPS agreement to deliver 100,000 affordable homes in Kenya. He sits on several boards across the world and he was recognized as the 2015 CNBC East Africa Entrepreneur of the Year. He is a sought after speaker, and he has spoken at the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in Nairobi with President Barack Obama. Let's rise to our feet and welcome for the first time to Wolfbeck um, from Kenya, Bishop Julian Keula. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord, Wolfbeck. Hallelujah. It is my distinct joy and humble honor to be here with you this January of 2024. Please allow me before you sit to share my deepest, deepest honor and gratitude to Pastor Poju and Lady Toyin for this amazing opportunity. I'm so grateful. And to the entire leadership, fellow speakers and pastors that have been here. Um, I want to shoot straight into what God brought me here to do. Um, the person that introduced me to Pastor Poju, um, who happened to be in this church when she worked in Nigeria, decided to fly with me here to just honor Pastor Poju. So I don't know where they are, but they're somewhere here. And I just want to thank God for that introduction. So for what you're doing here, what it takes to move a mountain like this, I recognize the gift of God that is operating here, and I say to you, congratulations. Um, I have 48 minutes to decide whether I'll be invited again or not. <laughs> so let me maximize my time by going straight to the word of God, to my fellow speakers that have been here impacting you. My dear friend, Pastor Jerry Easy, wasn't that an amazing ministration right now? Um, Nigeria, you are blessed. That all these people are coming from here. I know you've had others from other countries, but please don't take for granted what you have. I want to go to Matthew chapter 17, verse 20. If I can read the word of God. Yes, you can have your seats. Matthew 17, 20. And Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, for verily, assuredly I say to you, if ye have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, move from this place 
move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. I'll use NKJV version, please. Nothing will be impossible for you. Can we just welcome the Holy Spirit to continue moving in this amazing assembly? Father, as I share these words, may I decrease and you increase. As I share these few minutes with your children, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing unto thee, my God and my Redeemer. In Jesus' name, amen. I have an interesting responsibility and calling in the kingdom of God. Because of my work in the marketplace, I happen to have the privilege of speaking to God's children almost by being an interpreter of how we can be able to manifest from that spiritual dimension and see things happening beyond the spiritual, even into the physical. My responsibility in the kingdom has with it a dimension of care that I have to take to make sure that there is no element of looking at things materialistically, but understanding the provision through scripture for how certain things in the kingdom of God are sustained. Our faith has a very interesting characteristic in it, in that it dwells as one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. When you identify the gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, from the understanding of wisdom, knowledge, the gifts of interpretation of tongues, speaking in tongues, the gifts of prophecy, uh, miraculous works, healings. When you understand the gift of faith there, the gifts of the Holy Spirit are categorized into three categories. The first category is what you call the power to know. These fall under things like the gift of discernment, um, the gift of knowledge, uh, the gift of wisdom. These are the gifts to know. Then you have the gift to say where you get prophecy, interpretation of tongues, speaking in tongues. That's the gifts to say. So when you think of the apostolic and prophetic presbytery, there has to be a combination of understanding that faith does not fall under the saying gifts. Neither does faith fall under the knowing gifts. I kindly request the keyboardist to assist me. I'm one of those people that likes a little bit of background music. Um, C minor, if you don't mind. If you understand the gifts of the Holy Spirit, then you'll understand faith does not fall under a saying gift. You cannot tell me, show me your faith. Faith falls under the doing gifts. And so the gifts that have the power to know, which is the miraculous works, um, which is the being able to perform works of healing, and then faith comes in there. But faith has an interesting dimension because under the fruit of the Spirit, you will find faithfulness. You'll find self-control. Faith is the only one that has the element of being on both sides, of both gifts and uh, fruit. However, I don't want to get into that teaching today because there's something I'd want to do there in terms of exposition next time, but I want you to see that under faithfulness, the prestige of belonging to the fruit of the Spirit brings with it this amazing element. By the way, I bring you greetings from Kenya. We have so many people from Kenya that are watching, and I, I just want to convey our, our gratitude to you, Nigeria. There's so much happening between Kenya and Nigeria. So faithfulness sits under the prestige of the fruit of the Spirit also. Now, one of the scriptures I want to pay credence to today is 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. Moreover, it is required in stewards that one be found faithful. 1 Corinthians 4, 2. So, one of the requirements when you've gone through some of the school of thought that has been very well expressed through the servants of God that have been speaking to us and this amazing training assembly that has been happening here, you must come into the place where you have an understanding that faithfulness is a requirement of stewardship. What is it that we are supposed to steward? What are these mysteries? The Bible talks, if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1, you start to discover that there's a particular responsibility that we have 
let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries. But let it also be clear that this person has to have a particular quality that is called faithfulness. I'll come back to that. Just pack that at the back of your mind in just a minute. Now, this amazing conversation, when you think of it, is that faith and faithfulness are like Siamese twins. You can't separate them, and I'll explain why in a few minutes. But you begin to see that one of the things that our friend or apostle was teaching us last night about testimony, the faithfulness, the actions that are consistent with your faith, the report that comes as a result of your faith will require certain elements of stewardship so that when God begins to open certain doors, you not only walk in those doors, but there's an element of sustainability for what God has begun to put in your hands. I've seen certain things happen as believers rise and fall, rise and fall. Questions that are asked, is it something I did? Is it God testing me? Let me try and break a few things down for you today. Um, this awesome convocation that has been convened by a faithful steward here is to bring us together to explore certain thoughts, to explore certain scriptures, and to be trained to understand how certain things work. I loved listening to Apostle earlier today because one of the things I'll be dealing with is the understanding of seasons and times. I'm a student of seasons and times. And so when you understand scripture from that understanding of seasons and times, it is how you get to know what to do. Because the sons of Issachar, they understood the seasons and the times, and therefore they knew what Israel ought to do. So one of the things why you must redeem the time is when you understand seasons, you'll understand what to do and when to do it. Let me try and break this down a bit more. Faith carries with it weight. I want to try and deal with faith in two dimensions. Faith carries with it an element of weight. Now, when you think of weight in this way, I want to think of weight in the kabod. Faith as a mustard seed introduces seed time and harvest. When you think of seed time and harvest, the church has focused heavily on seed time. But I want you to know the Bible says and harvest. It means that people must also be taught how to handle harvest. We cannot perpetually stay on seed time. We must also teach how to handle harvest. We must understand the Bible is full of balance. In other words, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. So when you sort him the right way and the harvest comes, we must teach believers how to harness harvest to make sure that it doesn't run out. That it just not only doesn't run out, that it can generationally be beneficial to you and those that are around you. So faith carries with it weight. This brings a whole aspect of understanding that you must understand the winnowing process. Let me explain weight as I begin. When you think of weight and I think of harvest, you have to understand that the Bible says that the wheat and the chaff grow together, but there's a time of harvest when there shall be a separation. And that time of separation, when you think of um, farmers, when they're beginning to harvest, they use what you call a winnowing fork. Um, in Africa, sometimes we use the, the little basket and we shake things in the air. Do you know that process I'm talking about? So we take that and you take the fork and you lift up the harvest in the air. And there is a separation, but the determinant of the separation at that time is wind. Please come with me. When you think of wind blowing against the entire harvest, the separation of chaff and wheat happens because of wind, storm. What will cause the shaft to move away is the wind. But what will cause the wheat to sit is weight. So what will cause a believer to be able to sit in the midst of the storm is that there's a particular glory that comes out of trials and gives you a particular perception about tough times that will make sure even if the wind blows, there's a glory on the inside of you that causes there to be a sitting. Please come with me. This is important for you to understand because I sense the way God is going to bless some of you. There are some of you that are going to go through certain, listen to me, new levels, new devils. Every dimension introduces to it the warfare of that dimension. And therefore you cannot be, <laughs> somebody, somebody said to me the other day they left a particular church because people were talking about them. I said, that is, that is kindergarten. You're at kindergarten level of faith. The reason we talk about you in church is to give you practice about what's going to happen in the marketplace. 
The Bible says out there, it's dog eat dog world out there. Let me assure you, what you go through in church is nothing compared to what they'll be waiting to do to you out there. In the church, we might stab you in the back. Out there, we stab you in the front. So, we cannot have lightweights that are carrying immense dimensions unless they figured out how to count it all joy when they go through diverse trials and temptations, understanding this, that the trying of your faith produces the productivity that comes with that trial in James chapter 1 verse 2 is not just your regular trial. The word there, the, 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 the root word there of that word production of patience is the word stamina. Ah. Because in this kingdom, there's a way we sit. If it were not so, scripture would have told us. But when I look at Psalm 1, it says, blessed is the man who does not walk and does not sit nor does he stand. So there's a way we walk, there's a way we sit, there's a way we stand. There's a way we walk when we have a billion dollars, there's a way we sit when we have a billion dollars, and there's a way we walk when we have a billion dollars in the kingdom. And there's a way we don't do certain things. We don't sit in the seat of the scornful. We don't walk in the way of the sinners. But there's a particular dimension of sitting. When that sitting happens, you're able to sit in the middle of the storm because of the kabod. The weight of his glory begins to position you. Such a man shall be like a tree planted. That means you're not blown and tossed to and fro by every wind, by every conversation about what's happening to the naira and the dollar. God gives you the wisdom and the understanding that before Abraham was, he was. Before there was ever the introduction of the Roman, uh, um, uh, the Roman currency and the U.S. dollar, God was. He says in James 8:58. Before Abraham was, am. Um, the true meaning of that to understand, I need to finish with this first point because it's going to take too much of my time. But the meaning of that understanding in there is Jesus is saying, Prin Abraham genethai ego aimi. Before Abraham was, am. Um, English does a disservice. Can I get three volunteers, please? Four, actually. Four brothers, if you don't mind coming to me for a minute. Let me just make a quick demonstration here. Thank you. God bless you. If you don't mind just lining up here for just a minute. So we're going to assume this is pre-Abraham, Abraham, post-Abraham, post and this is Jesus. What Jesus is saying is that before Abraham was, face him, am. Um. So before he was, am, um, while he is, am, um, after he is, am. Um. Please come with me. This is a dimension you have to understand regarding faith because it's very crucial to how some of you will handle things in the marketplace. When he says that, it means that there is an element in God that is present in whatever is past in your life. He's not confined by time, which means he can be in my past while he's in my present. That is why he's called omnipresent. It means even as we sit here, he is still with my grandmother. And there are certain things he can be fixing in my story, in my past, to influence my future. Because before Abraham was, I'm... Um, so one of the things you will discover very soon about recovery and about restitution and about speed is that it is possible for God to enable men to go and fix things that happened historically and change a story of a person in that realm. Are you still together with me? Because Moses was able to go and completely undo something that Jacob had done regarding his seed. And he opens his mouth and says, let, let Reuben live. Where death had been pronounced, life was pronounced. I'm here to say it doesn't matter what happened in your past because before Abraham was, I am. And I can deal with things in 1968 the same way I can deal with things in 2024. Why am I saying that? Because then you understand that the scheme of the enemy is to completely shift your understanding of how past, present, and future works even in the marketplace regarding faith. But I want to teach you some things today. Are you ready for a ride? Thank you. Faith has weight. The second thing that faith should be seeking is that faith must seek knowledge. Faith must seek knowledge. This knowledge is going to give you advantage. This is why we've been here for these days so that we can have advantage about certain things that must happen in our lives. There's definitely something cooking in Africa, I can tell you, it's not the same. 
there's a, there's a dimension of hunger I'm seeing in a generation that is giving me such amazing joy because I'm seeing it in East Africa, I'm seeing it in West Africa, I'm seeing it in Central Africa. There's something sweeping across the nation. There's a generation that has decided to say, God, you're not skipping this generation. And God in his mercy and wisdom has decided to release certain things that are pertinent for us to understand how these things are going to work. When you talk about faith that moves mountains, you begin to enter the right training for understanding. There's a lifestyle that creates an appetite for the knowledge of God. And I've come to this particular understanding and yearning that there's something beyond what is seen by man. A desire to worship him in spirit and in truth. Apostle mentioned today some very important things because we have to understand that one of the things God wants us to do in redeeming time is to understand that Jesus had an encounter with a woman at the well and said, just because you've worshipped in this mountain, a time is coming and now is the time when they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Worshipping in a place for a long time does not necessarily mean I've understood the formula for certain things to live my life. Doing something as a routine and a cycle is not necessarily, there's, there's, a, there's an 11 day journey that took some people 40 years because you can worship for so long and do things in a particular way and not understand the benefit that faith has to have knowledge. That knowledge will cause you to overcome and overtake some things in your life that must be dealt with. And I thank God that in seven days of Wolfbeck, some of you have been able to put some things under your feet, even in the spirit. And we're going to see the manifestation of those things before this week is over. Yeah. Everybody that believes it shall be so shouted, amen. Yeah. Faith must seek knowledge. So in Philippians chapter 3 verse 13. Paul begins to show us an interesting discourse here. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind. So one of the things that faith has to have the capacity to do is to forget those things which are behind. God is constantly in the business of making some of you forget. It's not my message for today. And reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Verse 14 is my main theme. I press toward the goal. One of the reasons for understanding this message in its complete entirety of importance is that we can press, utilize energy and time and not press toward the goal. And so a lot of believers are frustrated because they've been pressing, but there's no result and there's a need for knowledge to be able to understand where the bullseye mark is. So that while I press, I press toward the goal. Yes, when I press toward the goal, I press toward an understanding that I'm pressing strategically. One of my prayers for this conference is that none of you shall press aimlessly after this. I refuse to spend four years here, three years there, two years here. No, from here, if my feet step in a place, it's because I've taken the time for the knowledge to understand it is the will of God for me to be in this place. To be able to understand which place I should be, what I should be doing, who I should be doing it with is beneficial for any child not to lose 10 years of their life. Find a faithful neighbor for me and tell them 10 years is a long time to lose. That neighbor is getting a little jealous. Tell the other neighbor 20 years is too long a time to lose in the wrong place. I thank God that you've presented yourself for knowledge so that there can be some unlearning. And so that you can be able to understand certain things that are important. Listen to me. I believe that there are certain biases that we form. I'm going to tell you an, an interesting Nigerian story. I have a Nigerian pastor at our church. And when he's speaking to us, it must be something he was taught. Um, I don't know which part of Nigeria. I think he's from Wari. And he comes and he says to us, our church, our church changed and became Ruak Assemblies. So he says, when he's spelling Ruak, he says, okay, go to www.aro. So in Kenya, we say, it's not Aro, it's R. He says, no, it's Aro. <laughs> we say, it's not Aro, it's R, Pastor Zino, it's R. He says, no, you, you Kenyans, you don't understand English. <laughs> Why does he say Aro? Because... Somebody taught him that it said arrow. Most of you don't understand that your faith is a result of your teaching. 
And therefore, if my teaching is skewed, my faith will be skewed. One of the things is I have a responsibility to make sure that I seek the Spirit of God to be under the right pupillage, not to lose 10 years of my life under the wrong teaching. When they, I lived in Houston for some time and there's a rocket that they were sending and they said if they were one degree off in releasing that rocket from NASA, it would have landed on another, prop, on another um, um, planet. It's the same in the kingdom. There are things that if I'm one degree off, I'll find myself losing 10 years. But tonight is a night of alignment. Tonight is a night of recovery and a night when God is going to begin to show me that those things that looked as if they were lost are about to be re-engaged in the knowledge that faith is releasing to me. Somebody shout knowledge. So, our biases can come from wrong teaching. My doxology, doxology is a simple word that simply means how I praise God. And I'll come to praise in my ultimate understanding of what I'd like to teach you tonight. Praise, how I praise God is based on my understanding how God should be praised, which comes from a place of how I was taught. So my doxology will influence my proxology. Basically, whatever it is I do has come from a place where that is how I was taught how it should be done. One of the hardest things that can happen in a classroom is to have to unlearn what I thought was truth to be able to engage now in what is going to give me furtherance. A truth can be applicable in a time of Moses that is not necessarily useful in a time of Joshua. In studying seasons and times, you'll discover that the energy I have to put in crossing a particular sea in the time of Moses may be different from the one I have to put in play in a time of Joshua. Just come with me. I want to make some sense in just a few minutes. Secondly, we talk about gathering for purpose. I'll come back to biases in a minute. So God is going to help us undo some thinking. Because I believe the season for Africa has come. Now let me explain. Africa has gone through phases. Today morning you were taught that this is also a historical book. You must use it for reference point of history. Africa has had a time of gathering. We have really gathered. But now I believe that our gathering is a different gathering. Uh -huh. There was a time Africa needed to be gathered for the sake of people hearing the gospel. But the dimension of gathering in our time is shifting because this feels more like discipleship. This feels more like training. Because, listen to me, we will continue to see souls received and saved for the kingdom of God, to the glory of God, the evangelical dispensation will never end. But it is not right to gather perpetually just to remember how yesterday felt for gathering. God will never gather his people in vain. And so, right now, the gathering you're seeing happening across Africa is a gathering that is supposed to produce something. Yeah, yeah. And that thing is supposed to produce certain evidence, not just to Africa, but to the world. That tells me that you must be very sensitive about what the Spirit of God is saying regarding even the dimensions of intellectual capacity that is available in the kingdom of God for what God wants to do. So the gathering happening now is a gathering of champions that are about to execute certain formulas and things that will cause another generation because there's no continent in the world that has more saved people than Africa right now. None. There's no continent in the world that has more Christians on a per capita basis than Africa, which means on the scorecard of evangelism, evangelism worked. But now we must ask ourselves questions which sometimes get me in trouble. How is it that the most evangelized continent in Africa has the highest infant mortality rate? How is it that the most evangelized continent in Africa has some of the most educated people but we are not seeing progress? How is it that the most educated and the most anointed continent in the world right now on a per capita basis is not necessarily seeing an end of corruption? I believe God has now set the stage for the rising of the church to demonstrate his manifold wisdom 
Because everywhere where they have tried, it has failed. The first world failed. The second world has failed. God is depending on the third world. <laughs> it is the only one left to be able to demonstrate that out of what you thought was nothing, something is rising. Hey. I need to continue, but I'm feeling something there. You have to understand that a season has come when there are some things we must promise ourselves will not be carried on to our children. There must be a generation to say enough is enough and this line shall not be crossed any longer. Something has to change in our generation. And I hope tonight I'm speaking to some of those people at Wolfbeck 2024. If I'm speaking to you, say I hear you. Okay, good. So we are gathering for purpose. We're not just teaching you faith for personal reasons. There's a responsibility dimension in the spirit when God opens up certain doors for you that are not for just your household. Oh, I'm coming. I'm getting warmer. I'm just getting started. In the book of Ephesians chapter 3 verse 1, the Bible begins to show us an amazing demonstration by Paul. He says, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, have you not heard of the dispensation of the grace of God that was given to me for you? And when I teach this, I share and show you that grace sits on men for men. Ay, ay, ay. There's nothing that sits on a man for a man. Anything that sits on a person sits on a person from a point where God's purpose has to be fulfilled. So when you see men of grace, they are willing to hold, even if it's inconveniencing for them and their families, to gather thousands of people in the month of January. Instead of being somewhere in Hawaii enjoying a holiday, they will do whatever they have to do to bring God's people together because what they carry is not for them. I'm trying to change the prayer for those who are praying to be billionaires to understand God is not interested in making you a billionaire. He's interested in his purposes being carried out in your life. If being a billionaire is an added effect to that, then you are aligned to what he's doing. Are you still in church? Can I continue or I leave it here? So we are gathering for a purpose. Somebody say we are gathering for a purpose. And I need you to look at someone square in the face and tell them we did not gather to waste time. We did not gather because you have nothing to do in January. But we declare in the name of Jesus, this January something is going to shift in the way we are doing what we are doing in Jesus' name. Somebody shout amen. amen. The third thing I want to make sure we demonstrate today, then I'll use my last 20 minutes to, to speak to you some deeper things, is that we have to have an understanding for dominion. Genesis 27 40. My prayer tonight and tomorrow as you finish tomorrow is that some of you will become restless. If there's anybody uncomfortable where they are right now, let them shout amen. I'm in the right church. I didn't hear you, sorry, my Kenyan hearing is a little skewed. If there's anybody that has reached a point of restlessness, let me hear you shout, I'm here. Esau came asking for one more blessing. Jacob said, I have nothing. He said, you must have something. He said, here's the formula. If you become restless... If you understand this place where you become tired of being tired, there's a place you pursue in the spirit, not out of frustration, but just out of a tiredness of a particular situation, where by virtue of understanding scripture and how faith works, you can change your family's destiny by becoming restless about the situation. Listen, some of the contracts I've signed across the world have come from a place of restlessness. I don't have the time to break it down for you, but sometimes you're up against giants. Sometimes you're up against Goliaths. You have to stand on the word and say, I'm not leaving Indonesia without this contract. Some of you just say, let it be according to the... <laughs> Listen to me, you must become restless about certain tides that have taken over your nation and say, enough is enough. There must be some things you can do. Listen to me. 
the kingdom of God is coming into a season where the restless among us, and when I say restless, I don't mean in terms of a state of mind. I mean in terms of a spiritual state that I've become restless about this torment from Satan over my family regarding an issue A, issue B, issue C, and I'm no longer going to stay in that place. Shout restless. So, the dimension of resources you need may be physical in nature, but you have to access them from a spiritual dimension. I want to give you a formula about how things have worked so that you understand how grace has worked. I came to your country, um, I don't know where Zubi is, many years ago, and I was invited by um, uh, Bishop Febida Hossa. I was speaking in Benin at CGMI. I met Mama, and the speaker before me was Bishop Oyedebo. I'm coming from Kenya. Listen to me. We are, we are a different culture. We're quite a different culture from you, but we, 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 we call us slow warmers. You know, Nigeria, I think you're like gas cooker. You catch fire quickly. We are like, we're like the, the, the metal plate. We heat slowly. But when we catch fire, you can't switch us off. So I came and I understand Ephesians 3.2 that what was sitting on Bishop Oyedebo was not for him. And I remember going to the house with him after that and he prayed over me and prayed over Kenya and said, this, the, he, he, I couldn't understand because from where I was coming from, I had not seen this dimension of grace before. He just taught on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Love is patient, love is kind. I didn't understand. He didn't jump. He didn't scream. He just said, love is patient. Love is kind. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes! <laughs> if you take love and you do things without patience, it will not work. I said, God, it cannot be this simple. <laughs> and by the time he was done, I understood this dimension of weight I'm talking about. Because the signs and wonders I saw, I chased after something. I said, sir, what I have seen, I must. He said, young man, when you go to Kenya, everything you have seen in Benin, you shall do. Ah, I did not need other words. I went, I looked at scripture. I saw how grace travels. I found out grace travels most effectively by words. I'm trying not to preach because I didn't come here to preach. I'm trying to be, I'm trying to be a little sophisticated. I thought grace traveled, but I found out according to John 17, 18. Jesus gave a report. He did not leave anybody a house, a car. He said, Father, the words you gave me, I have given them. 17, 8. The words you gave me, I have given them. That means when it comes to grace, the quickest methodology for grace to move is through words. Ah, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. These are certain keys in the kingdom. If you understand even how honor works, you begin to be able to understand that the six companies that I've built and did not work out before things started working does not need to happen to you because what I've gone through does not have to be your story. But when you understand how grace works, And I see that there are some of you here that are going to come out of this conference and begin things that cannot be stopped. I'm coming to you. I'm really, I'm really trying to pace myself. Listen to me. You don't have to have my story, but my story can participate in your life. By understanding how grace travels, we kick off from where Jesus left. We don't begin where Jesus began. Are you understanding? This kingdom moves from glory to glory, from revelation to revelation, because people understand that where my father left, my father's greatest achievement is my ground floor. It means the ultimate of my father. What was his university will be my kindergarten. Let me try this side. I think they are catching some of this revelation. Are you understanding what I'm talking about here? The way this thing works, 
you may be seeing me for the first time but in the spirit we are not meeting for the first time all the people in the middle are fine let me talk to the people on this side and the people on this side do you understand what I'm talking about here Uganda are you understanding what I'm talking about the spirit of the Lord God is upon you because he has anointed you to do some things therefore we must understand how we are going to build some things that will never leave our lives hi I have I have 12 minutes to finish this thing listen please sit down we have to have an understanding for dominion. Hey. Hey. There are three things I'm hoping to touch on in 11 minutes. Three things I'm hoping to touch on. First Corinthians 4:2 says, "It is required that a steward be found faithful carriers of the mysteries of God hey first lady I have to come back I cannot finish what I've come with so I'll invite myself <laughs> listen to me when I studied 1 Corinthians 4-2 I asked myself what are these mysteries? I don't have the time, whatever I'll finish, I'll finish whatever I can. But the first one that really amazed me was one of the mysteries that we've been given. Listen, Proverbs 25 2 says, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it is the honor of kings to search it out. That is one of my prayers today, that some of you will get a hunger that looks for certain things. When Daddy Oyedebo prayed for me in Benin, this was 2000 and 2010, 2011. He said, you shall do meetings like this. In Kenya, we had been told, and they can witness those that are watching online. They had said the days of stadiums are over. They had told us the days of crusades are over. That's the word that was going around. So I come from Benin. I'm seeing 40, 50,000 people in one place. You have to understand, for a Kenyan, that is a miracle. 50,000 people. When they shout amen, the ground shakes. What's wrong with you Nigerians? The ground was just shaking. Praise the Lord. Amen. Hey. I went back home on that word. As I speak to you, last year but one, we held a meeting. I was planning for 5,000 people. We had 80,000 people show up. Last year, same thing happened. We had 100,000 people show up. I said, uh-uh, this thing is working. So you may think I came here to speak, but I came here to collect. Ay, 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 ay. Oh my God. If it is happening in your country, it will happen in Kenya. It will happen in Uganda. And I started seeing something spreading around. My friend Apostle Lubega is in Uganda. Every every Wednesday. Is it Wednesday or Thursday? Every Thursday. 50,000, 60,000 people gathering every Thursday. What is going on? Somebody say grace is working. The revival is already here. If you are wondering what it looks like, it's already here. Shake a neighbor say the grace is working. Y'all are messing me up. I went, I studied about Archbishop Benson Idahosa. Mama Margaret showed me this is the chair he died on. This is what happened. I read everything. When we were there, Bishop Oedebo said, I have to go back to Lagos. And he left for Lagos. And Mama said, uh, my son, I think you can sleep in the room you'll sleep. I said, don't change the bed sheets. Don't change the towel he used. I entered that bed. Listen, I'm not trying to talk about sorcery or magician. The, what I'm talking here, you may not understand. But it has worked for me in business. It has worked for me in ministry. Because I never thought I'd see the day that 100,000 people are gathering in one place in Kenya. It just came out of the mouth of a man. So I decided to study Archbishop Idahosa. 
And I studied his relationship with Archbishop Duncan Williams. And I found out that there's a time he summoned Archbishop Duncan Williams. And he called for him three times, but Archbishop Duncan Williams had started becoming big, so he ignored the beckoning of his father. And with three words, his destiny changed. Because when Bishop Idahosa, Archbishop Idahosa got fed up, he said, it is well. Don't call him anymore. It is well. Three words. I found out grace does not need to use a lot of English. First lady, when I, when, I, when, I, when I lost my second company, I went to my spiritual father. I had 40,000 shillings, 70,000 naira in the bank account. I went, I withdrew everything. I went, I lay prostrate. I had studied that Idahosa story and I said, Papa, pray for me. Release oil for me. Do something for me. He said, ah, my son. He was eating. He said, my son, sit here. It is well. I said, ah, it is not well. I don't have money for my children. We've been kicked out of our house. Everything has gone bonkers. Nothing is working. He said, just relax. God is going to sort you out. I said, Father, take the oil. This is not a thing for talking, just talking. Get the oil. Pour something on my head. This needs a breakthrough of gigantic dimensions. Hey. And he kept saying three words, it is well. So I remembered when Archbishop Duncan Williams was telling this story, he said when things went bad for him in Ghana, they went bad. And he remembered being summoned by Archbishop Idahosa. He went to look for him in London. And he found him preaching at a hotel. He was staying at a hotel in London. And Archbishop Idahosa is coming down the stairs. I have five minutes. And he's coming down the stairs and he sees this man. And there's commotion and the man comes and lays prostrate and says, Papa, I'm sorry. Archbishop didn't even know what the man was crying. He said, what is it? What is it? Stand up. What is the problem? He said, please forgive me. Papa, with the heart of a father, just said, it is well. Three words. Changing people's stories. Kai. Jesus says, Jesus pronounces, Father, the words you gave me, I've given them. He says, and now I give you authority. Kei karadaba. To trample over serpents, over scorpions. Words. Turn to your neighbor, say words. Words can change your destiny. Listen, in case you thought we are here to release many words, we came to release three words. Turn to somebody, say, it is well. Hey, Baro Shata. I might as well have church for about five minutes. Say, it is well. Something is about to change in Nigeria. Nigeria, I have an announcement for you. It is well. To your business, I have an announcement. It is well. To your children, I have an announcement. It is well. To Wolfbeck, I have an announcement. It is well. Whatever you may be enduring and going through in your life, I, re I, re I declare over your life. Three words. Three words my spiritual father used. Old man, I love him. I'll bring him to Nigeria one of these days. Amazing grace. He sat over there and just said, son, it is well. I was crying. I had everything you can imagine coming out of my face. Three words. Grace shifted my life. The next thing I go to sleep that night, God releases an idea. And, and, and I begin operating under that understanding and that dimension. Am I talking to somebody? Am I communicating? And all of a sudden, I'm in one country, two countries, four countries, eight countries. I found out grace can open doors for you where that person has never been. There are countries I went into that I've never, I never got to even visit our office. When you hear that you have a blessing, that you have more room to receive, I want you to understand it happens. It is real. So, 15 countries, global awards, everybody beginning to talk where there was shame. I remember going for a board meeting in France. This is a former evictee. Former, couldn't buy diapers. One time my wife sent me to buy diapers. I didn't have money for diapers. <laughs> 18 countries. 20 countries. 22 countries. I stopped counting. It just began to mushroom and mushroom and mushroom. Because an old man was taking some tea and said,
this is when I started studying this thing to understand what you Nigerians have you don't even know. Some of you don't know what is in your country. Sometimes we pray for some of these graces to step into our countries and release 10 words. Please don't take the graces in your land for granted. Somebody shout three times, it is well. When this meeting ends, I want to believe the things I'm speaking to you. <laughs> One of the keys, Zubi, that exists is a key called the key of honor. And when I understood how that key works, it's the kind of key that if you stand up for an old woman in a bus, the day you reach a challenge that that old woman had gone through, that challenge will recognize you. Let the place some of us are at right now be your starting place. Did you hear what I said? Let this be the Sunday school for some of you. I know you're going to learn the principles and things you have to learn, but I wanted to release something into your lives today. Let the marketplace grace to operate in real estate, in the oil industry, in the education sector, in the technology sector, in the oil and mining sector, let that grace begin to operate in some of your lives right now in the name of Jesus. Hey! Can you pray in the spirit for just 10 seconds and begin to release a sound out of Nigeria that cannot be forgotten, out of Uganda that cannot be forgotten. Become restless in the spirit. Begin to declare this is the lowest I will ever be. My family is coming out of this. I'm tired of being tired. There's a dimension of grace being released out of this place. I release three words over you, Nigeria. It is well. No matter where you find the Naira, it is well. No matter what you see in the political space, it is well. God is not a man that he should lie or the son of man that he should repent. What he said he will do, he will do. I release grace at Wolfbeck 2024. Something new is about to be birthed in your household. In the name of Jesus, let somebody shout hallelujah.